diagnosis of this condition, but it is also, it is also interesting for uh, the uh, pre-surgical uh, planning. Because what the surgeon basically wants is to reestablish joint motion as best he can to uh, regain joint homeostasis. And if we can show the surgeon exactly what is wrong with joint motion, and then he can prepare better for the, if, uh, for the surgery. So uh, again, this, uh, this scanner is uh, pretty interesting in that type of uh, application because the 16 centimeters uh, coverage allows us to evaluate almost all the joints in the human body with a single turn of the x-ray tube. And uh, for that scanner, the top rota rotating speed of the x-ray tube is 0 0.35 seconds. So that is uh, pretty fast and allows us uh, the acquisition of very good uh, and uh, high quality images. So we can use two type of acquisition modes. The intermittent acquisition in which the patient moves and, he, uh, and you have volumes acquired with a uh, variable uh, delay between them or uh, continuous acquisition. And uh, the choice is really based on temporal resolution. If you need a lot of temporal resolution, and then you, you need to choose uh, uh, continuous acquisition. But continuous acquisition has some particularities. It needs to be limited to a five second exposure time due to radiation considerations. But uh, the, this uh, type of acquisition can be uh, reconstructed, uh, the images can be reconstructed retrospectively in any phase, even faster than the, rota the, the top rotating speed of the x-ray tube. So you can reconstruct images, for instance, every 200 milliseconds. And then if you couple that with partial scanning, in which a volume can be acquired in half than 360 degrees of rotation, that really boosts up the uh, temporal resolution. So this is basically what we do. We uh, uh, prepare the patients to perform a uh, homogeneous and uh, slow motion. The motion is timed, and we uh, coordinate our uh, scanning with the uh, patient motion. Patient motion. Uh, there's a little clock right there. The patient pays attention to the clock, and then the acquisition is timed. And once the patient has finished, finished the movement, we just stop the acquisition. Uh, we can couple that with a, uh, some uh, guidance tools and then stress testing, as we uh, show uh, in this, uh, as I'm showing in this videos with the uh, this uh, tool for peroneal supination and this uh, clenching fist study, which is pretty interesting for carpal pathology. Uh, obviously, those reduction again very important. Uh, this uh, technique is only possible because uh, those reduction tools became so effective that we can perform this type of ex examinations with uh, a, a limited uh, uh, dose exposure. And but again, same same as for, for perfusion, we we need to actively. Uh, um, work to reduce the dose. So again, we need to keep the exploration volume to a minimum. Uh, we need uh, iterative reconstruction for this type of uh, studies, and then uh, reduce, obviously, the number of phases. Once the patient finishes the movement, and then you obviously stop the acquisition to, uh, do not, wait, uh, to uh, not overexpose the patient. And then post -process, uh, in the post-processing, there are uh, denoising tools that are very interesting and then really enhance the quality of images. So if you acquire your images, and then they already look very good before you run ADER and uh, you post-process the images. It means that you're over-irradiating your patient. The images need to look a little noisy at first, and you post-process them, and then they're good. So we really need to adapt the acquisition parameters. So I'll uh, show uh, some clinical applications of this technique. Uh, snapping syndromes are a, a frequent uh, condition in the uh, muscle skeletal system, and uh, they happen when uh, some soft tissue or bony structure impinges and touches a other uh, structure doing uh, joint motion, and then this causes pain and discomfort to the patient. The problem with static uh, the conventional imaging evaluation is that it is static. Then what happens is we try to identify secondary signs, but we never see the pathology itself because it's dynamic, right? And if, if the patient is not moving, how can we uh, see it? So, uh, and the problem with it is there are multiple etiologies. So it's very hard to look at secondary signs and tell exactly what is wrong. So this is a patient with a snapping hip, and then as you see, as he contracts his thigh, thigh muscles, you can see that the iliotibial band rubs against the greater trochanter, and that this was uh, due to a, a abnormal flap of the iliotibial band, confirmed surgically, that was responsible for the patient's snapping and pain. Uh, 
Uh, this is another uh, technically difficult case because this woman presented a painful and grinding right scapula. When we performed conventional studies, there were, there were no uh, morphologic changes on the scapula. The only thing that we could see it was, it was that the scapula was a little bit higher than the other side. But uh, the problem with that patient is that the only way she could reproduce her symptoms was by doing a very rotating, a very fast rotating uh, motion of her uh, shoulder blade, and she couldn't reproduce that that uh, type uh, of motion slowly or in a timed manner. So we had to use continuous acquisitions. Those uh, images are reconstructed with a 200 millisecond interval. And then as we look at the dynamic study, we can see that the, the uh, superior angle of the scapula approaches dangerously the uh, second rib. And you can even see the rib moving after the uh, uh, scapula impinges against it. And this is a sign of scapulothoracic instability, which is a very hard diagnosis to make with static images. So another very interesting uh, application of this technique is to the evaluation of uh, dynamic instability. So in, those type of, uh, the, in this type of disor disorder, physical stress is needed to demonstrate the abnormality. And the clinical examination is not always sufficient to uh, tell exactly what, is the, uh, what structure is uh, uh, damaged. So uh, in, again, the problem with conven conventional static images is that the implication of joint instability based on secondary signs is at, at best challenging, not to say impossible. So uh, this is the aspect of the normal uh, scaphalunate ligament during stress. And you can see that the ligament stretches and go back to its original position during stress. And this is the normal ligament because it is sufficient. And you can see there's no significant bone movement when the ligament is stressed. So in this patient, uh, he was a 38-year-old man with uh, wrist pain after trauma. Uh, you can see that the ligament is a little irregular, but it is there. You can see the ligament right there, the dorsal portion, oh, sorry, the ventral portion, the dorsal portion. But it is when we stress the, uh, uh, the wrist that we show the abnormality. And then you can see that the, gap, the gapping of the two bones, the, sc uh, the scaphoid and the lunet, and you can see that during dynamic study, the ligament is completely insufficient. It just opens up, and then you can see the joint uh, uh, in, uh, space Increasing, you can even see a little a little gas bubble that forms due to vacuum phenomena in there. So this is another interesting case: patient with a, a fracture of the uh, of the radius, and then fra fracture consolidated properly, but the patient uh, has a, uh, a snap and pain during uh, radial ulnar deviation of the wrist. And then we performed uh, conventional studies and everything seems normal. There's no fracture. The, uh, bone, the relation between the carpal bones are maintained. Ligaments are in place. But it is during the dynamic study, you can see that the first, the proximal carpal roll just pops out of place during, during the motion. It's just right there. It goes and then boom, it pops. And then, so this is a, a um, uh, mid-carpal instability. So there's no uh, problem with the internal, uh, the, with the uh, each carpal roll. The problem is with the ligaments that connects the two, the both car carpal rolls. And uh, this, are, uh, this is uh, very difficult to identify with conventional imaging. So uh, uh, again, impingement and entrapment syndromes uh, are often, often, often uh, related to uh, dynamic uh, uh, motion, and uh, they are sometimes dynamic in nature. So uh, again, uh, it is very important to visualize the site of impingement because uh, it uh, may help uh, surgical planning. Because if we can identify exactly what structure is, imp is impinging against uh, the other structure, uh, we can uh, plan surgery better. And then this is a 39-year-old male amateur athlete with chronic hip pain on the, in the left side. And you can see the conventional x-rays shows there's a little bit of uh, coverage, a little bit of coverage defect on, the, on both uh, acetabuli. There's a little bit of uh, acetabular dysplasia. And there's also this uh, uh, osseous bump in the head neck junction on the left. And then we all think, oh, the, the thing is that we can see the uh, uh, degenerative changes on MR. And then the problem is uh, to identify which is uh, what is the origin of those degenerative changes? Is this 
are those degenerative changes related to acetabular dysplasia or are they related to um, uh, femoral acetabular impingement? And then literature shows that a radio, a radiographic signs of femoral acetabular impingement is, uh, are very unreliable. Then, and really, we have to go a little bit further to uh, 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 do that diagnosis. And then as we perform dynamic study, we can see that the osseous abnormality, as the patient flexes and externally rotates his uh, leg, comes in close contact to the area of degeneration, just right there. And you can see that the, uh, the osseous osseous bump approaches the joint line as the patient flexes, flexes his leg, again in this other view. So confirming that this diagnosis is, uh, the, the degenerative changes are probably related to femoral stabular impingement and not to uh, acetabular dysplasia. Another interesting case, patient with uh, persistent pain after uh, wrist trauma, and there is an old fracture of the scaphoid bone. And looking at those images, we can understand why this fracture never healed. It never healed because the distal fragment of the scaphoid impinges against the radial styloid, just right there. And you can, if you look at the 3D reformat, you can see that the, the fracture line is unstable and it opens up as the, as the two bones uh, uh, in, in, impinge. So uh, another interesting case. Uh, I'll finish off with uh, impingement and entrapment uh, by looking at this case, which is pretty interesting. Because at first glimpse, when you look at those images, you see, oh, I know what is wrong. I know why this patient cannot extend and flex his uh, elbow. The problem is that he has this huge foreign body right there, and he has a fracture of the uh, coronoid bone, uh, and, that, and that is the problem. But as you see that, you look the, at the images a little bit more, more carefully, and you see that during motion, this foreign body is just pushed aside, and it's not responsible for the deficit in the extension. The same for the uh, fracture of the coronoid process. You can see um, down there, when it, when it gets uh, close to the maximum flexion, the fragment just displaced, it, it is just displaced, it, just not, it does not block the motion. But in the other hand, you can see that in the coronoid, in the, in, in the coronoid fossa and in the olecranon fossa, there are a bunch of osteophytes, and those osteophytes are uh, responsible for the patient's symptoms. And you can imagine if the surgeon goes, goes in, he takes out the foreign bodies, he takes out the uh, fragment of the coronoid bone, and then he leaves the osteophyte in there, and the patient is going to keep his symptoms. It is uh, clear. Uh, I'll uh, talk about an interesting technique that is possible with dynamic CT, that is functional uh, CT angiography. And this technique is interesting because we get to perform multiple maneuvers with a single contrast bolus. So we inject, we inject the contrast and then we perform during contrast injection multiple maneuvers. And then uh, this is, for instance, our popliteal artery uh, uh, syndrome. And then we do the same contrast injection and we do the examination one phase in rest gastrocnemian contraction and hamstring contraction. And you can see that in this case, in both maneuvers, there is a significant stenosis of the right popliteal artery, second and third image, compared to the other side. And another very interesting application of this technique is for the evaluation of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. So again, uh, the contrast is injected, the patient is uh, with his arms overhead, and then he moves the head from one side to the other during acquisition. And this uh, is the normal costal vincular pinch, and you can see the subclavian artery moving freely in that space. And then in this patient, it is obviously, obviously pathologic, because you can see that the artery is compressed and even uh, occluded during head motion. And then we can also, uh, you know, uh, reformat those images differently. And this is a 17-year-old male with a left upper limb pain during physical activity. He has bilateral uh, cervical ribs, and then he has a, uh, a, a fusion of the right, uh, left cervical rib with the first rib. And then this fusion is related when he moves his head. There's a significant uh, uh, stenosis of the left uh, uh, subclavian artery. But looking at these images with a little bit more uh, detail, we can see that the bone uh, structures are related to par are partially related to that obstruction. You can see that in this part, it is the bone that is obstructing that subclavian artery. But the obstruction continues further laterally, and you can see there's some soft tissue in there that is responsible somehow for this uh, stenosis. So if you only treat the bone, the problem is going to, the patient's probably going to keep a residual uh, stenosis. Uh, 
Uh, I'll finish off with a complex motion, complex motion analysis. And uh, this is a, really a new tool for the evaluation of complex uh, joint motion. And this is an ongoing investigation in our institution to characterize normal and pathologic, pathologic movement on the subtalar joint. So in pronosupination, we're uh, describing a bone relation during this movement and uh, measuring angles and um, uh, 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 measuring the angles and relations between those bones to quantify and uh, try to analyze better uh, subtalar joint motion. And uh, this is an, uh, an example of how could that could help us. So uh, this is a patient with a recurrent ankle sprains. You can see that the cervical ligament is completely pathologic. It's calcified from uh, head to toe. And then when you look at static, static images, you, you have, uh, you know, um, you, you're willing to say that this ligament is pathologic. It's probably, uh, this patient probably has subtalar instability. But, but as we perform dynamic studies, you can see that the, the subtalar joint is uh, completely normal and this ligament is sufficient. It, it, is, uh, it, it, it does not spread and all the measures are compatible with, uh, are uh, equivalent to those patients without trauma to the subtalar joint. So, in conclusion, um, CT, I mean, the equivalent one, provides high and, indep uh, high and independent spatial and temporal resolutions. And if you couple that with low dose, you come up with a new tool to evaluate joint motion. And this is really something new because it provides a new insight to physiology of joint motion. And uh, we are beginning to see that this technique allows us to accurately diagnose dynamic joint pathology. So, at first, we were trying to imply a notion of motion looking at static images. And then today, we are, uh, you know, looking at motion as it happens. And then we can, uh, you know, see the uh, pathology uh, going on in the patient in vivo. So that uh, clearly increases our diagnostic power. Thank you very much.